Welcome. And welcome to those who are watching online. We are in Hebrews 11 tonight, trying to get through the whole thing, but uh, we're not going to rush. Of course, I joke about that kind of stuff before class, but we're about the substance and about exalting Christ, not uh, efficiency. And it is about quality of study, not quantity of verses. But I do want to, it is a unit, chapter 11, and I want us to see the flow of the unit. I'm calling this study, Walking by Faith to a Heavenly Country. And as we study through it, you'll see why I'm calling it that. Walking by faith to a heavenly country. And if you've read or know anything about John Bunyan's classic book, The Pilgrim's Progress, that rings a bell. The book is an allegory of the Christian life and his journey from the city of destruction to the celestial city. Hebrews 11 is about faith, not as a, a religious idea, but as a way of living, as a way of persevering till you reach your final reward, your inheritance, a heavenly country. So we're, it's not just that we have faith, we do have faith, it's something we possess, but it's a way that we live, it's a way that we walk, we walk by faith to a heavenly country. That's the Christian life. And you'll see that come right up out of the text as we go through it. Let me pray for us and we'll get right into it. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for all that you have done for us and in us and through us by Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit, for your glory, according to your eternal purpose. And we sit here this evening and... Uh, supernatural favor, infinite grace rests upon us, Lord, so stir us up to fix our eyes on Christ and give us a greater passion for your word, not only passion to believe it, but to read it and study it and know it and cherish it and preach it and teach it and share it so the world would hear of Christ. Father, we pray that you would use us. Do a mighty work for your name in our day, we pray. Amen. Hebrews 11, walking by faith to a heavenly country, to begin, I want to point out verse 1 and then verses 13 through 16. They are where the title most directly and immediately comes from. And then we'll come back and work through the chapter under different headings. Verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Let's just stop right there. So things hoped for are future things. And it's not using the word hope like we would use the word hope in our culture uh, <clears throat> to mean like a wish, like I hope we have pizza tonight, or I hope we go to the park tomorrow. We, you wish we have pizza, but you're not sure you're going to have pizza, and you wish you're going to the park, but you're not definite certain you're going to the park. Christian hope is a certain future promised by God. It's not a wish. It's not a maybe. It's a guaranteed future. It's a certain future. What, how do we know it's certain? God promised it. So it's based on God's promise. So faith is the assurance of things hoped for, future things. And as we come down through the chapter, you'll see that he's talking about our eternal inheritance. Verses 13 through 16. These all died in faith. He's talking about uh, saints in the Old Testament. These all died in faith. Not, you can circle that, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. They were not in their true home. They were not in their final home. Verse 14, For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. And in the context, we'll see this. What, he's what does he mean, uh, people who speak thus make it clear? 
He's talking about people of faith, people who live by faith in God, people who walk by faith based on God's promise. They're seeking a homeland. They're not there. The homeland is future. They see it from afar. They haven't received it. It's a homeland that they're seeking. Verse 15, if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. So if they, if they were fixed upon where God called them from, they would have gone back there. But that's not the life of faith. The life of faith looks forward to things hoped for. But as it is, verse 16, but as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Do you see that? They desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. So, you know, if this phrase sounded weird to you when I put it up there at the beginning, that's where it comes from. That was the saint's hope, the believer's hope all throughout history. A heavenly inheritance, a heavenly home promised by God. That's where they were fixed. And that's what enabled them to endure persecutions and endure trials. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be their God, for he has prepared for them a city. So right in this passage, 13 through 16, there's a city that God has prepared, and they're looking forward to it. There's a country, a heavenly country that God has prepared, and they're looking forward to it. There's a homeland, end of verse 14, that God has prepared, and God has promised, and they're looking forward to it. They see from afar, and they greet from afar. And that's what faith does. It brings things that are far near. Things that are farthest, right? Heavenly things, future things. It brings them near by faith. Walking by faith to a heavenly country. The entire chapter is about what that looks like. Okay? All right. I'm going to rip through this without rushing. I had a basketball coach, he always used to say that in high school. He would say, go as fast as you can, but don't rush. That was, oh, that's a good, uh, good proverb for any kind of athletics. You have to go fast. You've got to motor it up. You're, in, you're competing, but don't rush. If you rush, you'll mess up. So I'm going to go as fast as I can because I want to get the whole chapter, but I'm going to try not to rush. Verse 1, and what we're looking at right now is the essence of faith. The essence of faith. Number one, it has to do with things hoped for. We've already said that. But I'll write it up here to make it official. It has to do with things hoped for, a.k.a. future things. Verse one, first, first clause. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Assurance. Link that back to verse 39 of chapter 10. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. So we're, not, we're not those who give up. We're not those who, when the going gets tough, we cave in and abandon our confession. We're not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Shrink back and destroyed is lose your faith and judgment falls upon you. Those who have faith and preserve their souls... Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Secondly, second clause, it's the conviction of things not seen. So it has to do with things unseen. So it has to do with future things, but it also has to do with unseen things. You believe that you have a soul. The secular world doesn't believe you have a soul. You're made in the image of God because you have a soul. You believe in God. God is invisible. You believe in Jesus. Jesus is invisible. You believe in angels and demons. They're invisible. You believe in a heavenly realm. Invisible. We believe in, we have an assurance of future things that God has promised. But we also have a conviction. It means a a strength of faith. These things are real. Of things that are invisible verse 2 for by it by faith the the people of old received their commendation a commendation from god approval from god 
For by it, by faith, the people of old received their commendation for God, or uh, of commendation from God. They received their commendation. So, thirdly, still on the essence of faith, it has to do with pleasing God. It is the only way to please God. So faith has to do with things that are hoped for, future things. It has to do with things unseen, invisible things. It has to do with pleasing God. It's the way to be commended by God. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, another word for faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's the order uh, that redemption came first to the Jew, then to the Greek. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith unto faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. It is by faith that we receive life from Christ and in Christ. And then it is by faith that we live in Christ. The gospel is the power of God to everyone who believes. So faith is the way to become a child of God. We're saved through faith. Romans 3, 21 and 23. Many have called this paragraph the heart of of the New Testament, the heart of the whole Bible, Romans 1, 21 through 26. I'll, I'm just going to read uh, three verses here. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, again... Faith is the way to be made right with God. And you can skim down to verse 28 in Romans 3. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. It's the way to be come and to be pleasing to God. It's by faith. And quickly here on this word righteousness that was in Romans, the Romans 1 verse and the Romans 3 verse about the gospel as a revelation of righteousness. The law also was a revelation of righteousness. The righteousness of the law, because the law revealed God's character, God's commands are a reflection of his character, and to obey those commands is to, um, is to reflect God's character. But the law exposed sin. It could not provide a righteousness to the sinner. The law revealed God's righteousness but, and exposed man's unrighteousness. The gospel actually provides a righteousness for sinners. So that's how the gospel is a revelation of righteousness in distinction from what the law did. Through Jesus Christ, through the gospel, God provides a righteousness for sinners. We receive that by faith, and therefore, we're pleasing to God. It's not by a work that we do or a collection of works that we do. So back to Hebrews 11, number... Uh, faith is about things hoped for, future things, things unseen, invisible things. It's the way to be, to be and become pleasing to God. Now verse 3. <clears throat> by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Now this is interesting because it's... Not talking about a future thing, it's talking about a past thing. And it's talking about something supernatural, God creating the world. But the world itself is a visible thing. By faith comes understanding. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. Now why do we believe that the universe was created by the word of God? Because the Bible tells us that the universe was created by the word of God. Right? So don't overthink it. This is not... Uh, complex, deep theological things here. God has told us that. God told us he created the world, the universe, with the word, with the word of his power. So it's by faith that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Right? Created things cannot create themselves. And created things cannot create things out of nothing. You can get... Um, get a million of the smartest 
uh, scientists in history, give them unlimited resources, technology, money, and time, unlimited time. They cannot, on their own power, bring into existence one grain of sand out of nothing. They can manipulate things and do things uh, with atoms and molecules that already exist, but they cannot, people cannot bring into existence things out of nothing. Only God can do that, and only God has done that. It's by faith that we believe that truth. Next, go down to verse, I want to skip some verses here, and then we will, we will back up and look at uh, verses 4 and 5. But just for now, on, when we're on the essence of faith, I want to look at verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's the same thing he said at the end of, um, what was that, verse 2? All of verse 2. It's the way to be commended by God. This is saying the same thing in a different way with the way, with the word please. Verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God, and we've already talked about that too, right? Faith is the way to, um, to become a child of God. Drawing near to God is saying that same thing. We draw near to God, we come to God through faith. But then here's what else he said. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So now we're talking about what I'll just put here, the, the object of faith. The central, supreme object of faith. That is what faith is looking to. Right, you have... Um, in a sentence, you could have a subject and then a direct object. The subject is the one who does the thing, and the direct object is the one who's the object of that thing. Dave throws the ball. The object of our faith is God. We're the subject. We have faith in God. And that's what he says here. Two things. We must believe that God exists, and then what does it say? He rewards those who seek him. There's two things he's pointing out there about God. God's goodness. He gives, God gives rewards. And God's faithfulness. What he has promised, he will give. God will not break his... We break our promises all the time. Even when we try our best to keep them, we don't ha always have the power or the memory to keep our promises. But God does. So the object of faith is God. Now that's one quick summary in a huge Bible. And so when we say God is the object of our faith, that must be understood in the context of all of Scripture. God's revelation of himself through Christ. His revelation of himself through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ's work of redemption. This is God's revelation of himself. Jesus and his work of redemption is the climactic revelation of God. That's where our faith is fixed upon. And that's, I've been saying that every week, well, hopefully, I mean, I purpose to, maybe I forget it. Every week in this um, study on Hebrews, this is about Jesus living and reigning in heaven and serving as our great high priest, and he's the object of our faith. He's the object of our affection. He's the one we pray to. He's the one we worship. He's the one we're thinking about when we're driving to church on Sunday mornings. He's the one we think about when we wake up uh, Monday, Monday morning. And when we lay our head on the pillow Thursday evening, it's Jesus who lives in heaven. This is God's revelation of himself. Jesus. If we've seen the Son, we've seen the Father. So the object of our faith is everything. If you take that away, it's just man-made religion and ideas and rituals. This is about a living God who's revealed himself through a living Christ and his redemption, the object of our faith. Now, we're going to back up to verse 4 and work through the chapter. Now, the rest of the chapter is about one thing. These are just sort of like overview points on the nature of faith or the essence of faith. The rest of the chapter is about one thing regarding faith. Faith is the way... Children of God live on earth. 
It's the way we live on earth. It's a way of life. And then he just goes through different examples. So let's rip through them. Not rip through them. Run through them. Stop me anytime for an insight or a question. All right? Good. Verse 4. By faith, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith he died, and though, though he died, through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. He still speaks as an example to believers in the present age, which is the context, right? We're looking to this great cloud of witnesses. He still speaks as an example of a man of faith who lived on earth by faith, and he offered it, he obeyed God. He offered sacrifices that were acceptable. Why were they acceptable? Because they were offered in faith. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. This is not a, this, it, this issue of being commended by God and pleasing God um, by works done in faith is not a throwaway issue in this chapter. It's already come up a bunch of times. This is the way we live. If we want to live life pleasing to God, be a, live a commendable life in God's eyes, not the world's eyes, it will be by faith. Now, if you want to know the mysteries of Enoch, I'm not your guy, but let's look at what he says here and just accept, uh, you know, think about it. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Uh, that's a rare uh, thing. Not totally unique. Who was the other one who was taken up like Enoch? Elijah. So almost unique, but not quite unique. But, uh, and the, but it was by faith. I think the general point here is to enjoy and experience uh, God's intervention in our lives, God's work in our lives, you'll need to be walking by faith. And that's what Enoch was doing. Because look at what he says next. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God, obviously by faith. So that's the point. Enoch was living a life of faith. He was walking by faith. And therefore, he got to see God do this thing in his life. And you may not get to see God do this thing in your life, but if you walk by faith, you'll get to see God working in your life and doing things in you and through you. So by Abel, by faith Abel, by faith Enoch, verse 6, and without faith it is impossible to please him for whoever draw near to God must believe that he exists, right? God is the object of faith and that he rewards those who seek him. And again, it should be obvious by now, those who seek him by faith. Those who seek him by faith. And, and uh, let's see, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he was condemned by the world and became aware, an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So if anyone ever asks you how, how was Noah saved, it would be by faith. He received righteousness that comes by faith. By the way, that's the answer to if someone asks you about anyone's salvation. They're saved by, if they're saved, they're saved by faith. How are they righteous in God's eyes? By faith in Jesus Christ. It's the righteousness of Christ that we are clothed in. So, the reason I'm stopping the outline here is because now what you get throughout the chapter is just different aspects of what that looks like, what, what it looks like to live by faith. Abel making offerings, Noah obeying. Those, 
are the two central things. Obedience and offerings and worship. And then what we'll see comes up also is it's the way you receive your inheritance. It's the way you obey. It's the way you worship. It's the way you receive your inheritance. Verse 8 well, let me see if I want to do Abraham first or read these cross-references first. Now, let me read these cross-references, and then we'll stop for questions. I wanted to read one more in Romans. Romans 10, 10 through 13. If you want to turn there, you can. Romans 10, 10 through 13. I like this a whole lot because it tells you where faith happens. Faith happens in the heart. It's not just words we say. It's not just things that we know. Although it will lead to words we say. And it's, it involves things we know. But faith is a heart reality. Romans 10, 10 through 13. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And then with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him, right, he, God's the object of faith, Christ is the, is the object of faith, will not be put to shame. Because there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Obviously, call on him and call on the name of the Lord means to call on him by faith. Call on him by faith. It's not just words. You'd have to rip that out of the context and throw the rest of Romans in the garbage and burn it to, to, to interpret from this that this just means you say these words and repeat after me and you'll be saved. We call on God through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, James 2, 17 James 2, 17. So faith is a heart reality. And faith, true faith, leads to obedience. James 2, 17. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It's not a living faith. It's a false faith. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. So works, the outward manifestation of an inward faith. Works by themselves don't save. Of course, that's clear in Scripture. But saying you have faith, but you have no works, does not save either. You're deceiving yourself. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. It's almost like he's shaming them in light of the demons. At least the demons have some kind of reaction to what they believe about God. Uh, and one more in James 2, verse uh, 26. As the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. And the problem in James is, is not saying to them, you guys have true faith, but you don't have works. So what you need is, is more works. What he's trying to show them is they don't have true faith. They don't have true faith, some of them. And they need to repent and believe the gospel. And in, in the true faith, then they'll have works. Uh, two more here, John three sixteen. Someone want to recite it? For God so... Yes. And the B word is, is the one there. Believes. Whoever believes in him. Whoever has faith in him. Whoever trusts in Christ. So faith is from the heart. Faith always leads to obedience. Faith is um, what gains us an inheritance. We'll have eternal life. And one more here. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. You don't have to turn there. For we walk by faith and not by sight. It's the way we live. It's the way we walk. So the heart, and then obedience, and then inheritance, 
It's a way of life. Uh, back to Hebrews. Now we'll do uh, questions, and then we'll talk about Abraham. Abraham's a long section, so I wanted to get that in before we talk about him. Yes, Neil? Not really a question, but just thinking about the object of faith and how generally the world thinks of only religious people as being people of faith, but everybody is people of, or people of faith. I had a brother-in-law who was an atheist who once commented, like, I'd like to have faith that you'd have. I'm like, you do have faith. It's just the wrong object. Yeah. You have faith in science. You believe that matter is eternal and just somehow exploded into being and that this evolution took place. It's the object. We all are people of faith. It's the nature of human beings, whether we're believers in God or not. Yeah. And so just how important it is. And even for believers, that the object of the faith is the God of the, God of the Bible and not a God of our own creation. Yeah, that's right. It's not my idea of God. That's right. It's a great point that Neil makes. And just in case this mic wasn't on, it was, it was the fact that we all have faith. It's just a question of whether it's in God or in something else, whether it's science. Our own reason is the common one, right? I have faith in my own reason. I say this is right, therefore it must be right. Um, but by nature, we're worshiping uh, beings. We're worshipful beings. We will worship something. We'll trust in something as the ultimate authority and guide for our lives. Yeah, that's a great comment. And um, we've got to humble ourselves and worship God and believe God according to his revelation. Anyone else? Okay. Abraham. Hmm. Write myself a note. Give me one second. I don't want to forget this. And you're going to have to wait to see what it is. But that's if I remember to say it. Okay. Abraham. Verse. Where's that? Eight? All right. By faith. Get, get comfortable with that phrase. It's going to keep coming up. By faith, Abraham obeyed. Obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. Obedience, inheritance. Obedience, inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Uh, was it a blind trust? No, it wasn't a blind trust because it was trust in God based on God's concrete promise. So it was a thing hoped for. It was a future thing. It was an unseen thing because he didn't see it yet. But it wasn't blind and arbitrary. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise, heirs, future thing. They're going to inherit something based on God's promise. For he was looking forward to that city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. We know that's a heavenly city because he says it later on. Uh, verse 11, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful, who had promised, right, faith based on God's promise. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Now these all died in faith, Abraham Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, these all died in faith. Noah, Abel, uh, not Enoch, not having received the things promised. So 13, I think, when it says these all, I think it's just talking about uh, Abraham and his, his lineage. That was the heirs of God's redemptive promises. They all died in faith but did not receive the things promised. But having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, right, Ur of the Chaldees, they would have had opportunity to return. In other words, they could have gone back if they wanted to. Remember the context of Hebrews. Try to say this every week. There was persecution. There was temptation to go back to the old ways of Judaism fall away from the Christian confession to avoid persecution. Uh, maybe their confidence was wavering. 
don't go back. Don't go back. You must keep your eyes fixed on Christ in heaven. Now here's an example of a good witness from the patriarchs. If they, if they had been thinking of where they came from, they would have gone back. But they were looking forward. As it is, verse 16, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city, a heavenly city, a heavenly country. That was the promise of God. And that's always been the promise of God. This has always been his purpose to create a people for himself that would dwell with him in heavenly glory forever. And of course, that was held out as promised to Adam as symbolized in the tree of life. We fell into sin. Adam and Eve fell into sin. And so now it's through redemption, not creation, it's through redemption through Christ that God creates that people to dwell with him forever in heavenly glory. That's the story of the Bible. That's the purpose of God. He's creating for himself a people holy unto himself. He's gathering up lost, wicked sinners through Christ to create a people for himself, to dwell with him forever in a heavenly city, a heavenly country, a city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is for God, heaven, heaven. And that's where we're going. And ultimately, the new heavens and the new earth. And that was what enabled them to live by faith and walk by faith. Things hoped for. That's how he started the chapter. By faith, Abraham. So faith, uh, oh, I do have this broken down. I'm not going to write it down, all of it on the board. But verses 2 through 9. No, you know what? I am. I'm calling an audible. I am going to write this on the board. hope you memorize this. This will be the easy portion of the test next week. This will be the matching. Right? You always love the matching section because there's always a chance you're going to get 70% of them even if you don't know it. So that was the essence of faith. Now we're looking at just the different aspects of life lived by faith. Let me, I'm going to write the entire thing up here so I don't have to keep going back and forth. Generally speaking, verses 2 through 9, uh, faith obeys. God's call. It obeys God's call. It obeys God's commands. Faith also, verses 2 through 9, generally speaking, rests in God's promises. That doesn't mean take a nap. It just means this is what keeps you going. This is where you have peace. This is where you find contentment. Not things, not popularity not leisure. And then verses 10 through 16, generally speaking, there's so much overlap here, but I'm just trying to get some concrete application out of this. Generally speaking, 10 through 16, faith looks forward. Faith looks forward. It moves forward in obedience based on the promises of God that God has revealed. Um, but it's looking forward to an inheritance. 17 through 31. For faith, and you know this from the Abraham narrative, and that's what he's going to talk about soon. Faith endures testing, and faith something else through testing. Faith is what by testing strengthened faith is strengthened by testing and through testing verses 32 am I going to have to crouch down here that would just be unprofessional let me see if I can pull this off by hunching over 32 through 39 just puts a huge exclamation point. There, I'll just draw it instead of it. It just puts a huge exclamation point on everything else that's already there and then brings us back to the whole point of what was promised. What was promised to them and what, what is promised to us. They're recipients of the same thing that we are recipients of. Fellowship with Christ in heaven in the true holy of holies. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. All right, where did we leave off? Was it 17? 
So now we're moving into that faith endorsed testing and the strengthened by it. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So now there's a promise. There's an actual promise he's referencing there. He considered that God was able to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So, faith endures testing based on God's promise and in view of God's power. They don't all have to start with peace, but he perseveres based on God's promise with a view to God's power. He considered God was able. What a settled confidence that Abram had in God. God will fulfill his promise. God will keep his word. Abraham believed it. And he was willing to sacrifice Isaac even with that, because of that faith. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. And that was, uh, long, that was before, long before the Exodus, but it was based on God's promise that that would eventually happen, that Joseph could speak of it. Verse 23, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Oh, that we would live that way. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. Boy, that we would live that way. That Christ is our treasure, for he was looking to the reward. He was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible, the object of faith. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, obedience, faith obeys, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. Obedience. Obedience to God's call. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. By faith. Faith endures testing. Faith is strengthened by it. James 1 Two, and f- 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, the testing of your faith produces a stronger faith. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It will help you mature. It will grow you. It will sanctify you. It will strengthen you. Of course, it's God working through our trials, working in our trials and through our trials to strengthen us for his purposes. But it's faith endures testing and faith is strengthened by testing. And so often when we're tested and when we're disciplined by the Lord, we are tempted to think that God is absent and has forgotten about us. Maybe he's disciplining you. Maybe he's trying to wake you up to something. Maybe he's trying to strengthen your faith. He's not trying to harm you. The devil tries to harm us. The enemy tries to harm us. God, in his providence and his power, will help us and strengthen us. But it's painful and it's difficult because we idolize comfort and pleasure and we don't have God's view of things. We're limited, we're sinful, so that's why it has to be by faith. This, that this trial will 
bring me closer to God, not turn me against him. Will make me rest in his arms more than ever before, not make me resent him and get angry and bitter at him and curse him to my friends at work. So we have to have the faith perspective when those trials come. And those trials and those testings will strengthen us. Uh, Before we look at 32 through 39, hey, I think we're going to make it. I think we're going to make it. Doubters, you doubters. (laughs) Sure. It's called Saints. And in that book, it said that a lot of things that we go through in this life, God is preparing us for our time in heaven that he has jobs for all of us. We're not going to be just sitting around. And so the difficulties we go through now is preparation for that heavenly realm. But I had never heard that before. Yeah, I think that's true. I think everything here is preparation for the, for the eternal. And in the, in the grand scheme of things, our life here is just a snap. And um, I do think that's true. There's only so much we can say about anything in terms of, you know, what exactly what it's going to look like or be in the new he- in the new heavens and the new earth. But we will still be ourselves. We'll just be our heavenly resurrection body selves. And so, for for a concrete example of what you're saying, I, I would agree with that. So, your spiritual gifts, you will still have. You'll just have them at a higher heavenly level i don't think we get to heaven and we all become just this uh like like robots who is exactly like we'll still be ourselves we'll always be who we are we just won't always be what we are we'll ha- we'll have resurrection heavenly bodies and we'll be perfected and so uh yeah i agree i th- this life is preparation for eternity and um it's all one grand revelation of god's glory that we'll worship him and serve him and in truth and righteousness and holiness with no sin, no temptation, no, no gossip, no bitterness, no loneliness. It'll be nice. And uh, I agree. This is all preparation. I was reading that today in James. Uh, the verse doesn't come to, to mind, the exact verse, but just that we're a vapor. Who's, we're here and then we're gone. Any other thoughts or comments or follow-up on, on that thought? What's the proverb that we would would number our days, teach us to number our days, keep it in perspective. Um, 32 through 39, this just puts an exclamation point on all of it, but we'll see this idea that they did not receive what was promised. And now this is traditionally what's Hebrews 11 called. What's this kind of the, uh, the cute little title we give Hebrews 11? The what? The chapter, the faith chapter. Yeah, I've heard it called the Hall of Faith, almost like the Hall of Fame. And it is. It is. And there's two sides of that coin. They all lived by faith, and yet they, in their lifetimes, they did not receive the ultimate promise. Only as Christ, in Christ will they receive what was promised. The same thing we receive what was promised. Verse 32 through 39. And what more shall I say? That's why I said this is just an exclamation point. He's just like, okay, what, what else do you need me to say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. So Old, old uh, Testament saints did believe in resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. 
They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth. All these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. That's where we're going to end. But, if you skim back through that paragraph, 32 through 39, you see everything that we said about faith in there. The fact that they had to endure hardship and trial, endure testing, the, faith, the point that um, faith leads to obedience, and he lists different kinds of obedience, and the faith is based on God's promise and is looking forward at what God has promised. Faith is how they were commended by God. And all these, though commended through faith, that's how the chapter began, basically. I mean, it gives the essence of faith, and then, and then this is the way you're commendable in God's eyes. This is the way you please God, through faith, by faith. It's by faith that you obey. It's by faith that you receive an inheritance. But now that's the thing he says, they did not receive what was promised. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's easy. Jesus had not yet come and brought the fullness of redemption yet. He did not come, fulfill the law, die for sins, um, ascend into heaven as exalted priest, and then pour out the Holy Spirit in full measure. That didn't happen yet, so they couldn't have received it. They couldn't have received the heavenly inheritance apart from Christ's accomplished work. They, they didn't receive it at that point. They're there now in heaven with Christ. But they didn't receive it, and they couldn't receive the heavenly country that God had promised apart from Christ's accomplished work. And I can't receive it, and you can't receive the heavenly city apart from Christ's accomplished work. And not just the fact that he accomplished it, but that we come into fellowship with him through faith. God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Did my mic just go out? Or is that just in my head? There it is. Um, so, I want to highlight the phrase, what was promised? Verse 39, in the, uh, right at the end, they did not receive what was promised. I'm going to give you one word on it. I think I, get, I think I just answered that, but with kind of a mouthful, like an explanation. But I, I want to si simplify that down to one word. What was promised? The Redeemer. So the whole Old, Old Testament is about the promised Redeemer. And the whole New Testament is about the promised Redeemer. The promised Redeemer comes on the scene. He delivers from sin. He destroys the devil. And he grants eternal life and fellowship with God. That's what was promised. A Redeemer to deliver man from sin and death, to destroy the devil and the works of the devil, and to grant eternal life and fellowship with God. And so now there's our object of faith, the Redeemer, the person, the work, and the blessings that are found in Jesus Christ. That's the object of our faith. Here's, now here's this note I made to myself earlier. Because I want to make sure I talk about faith in relation to some, ver some other very important, well, very important, that's an understatement, necessary aspects of the Christian life. Uh, primarily love. All right. Forgi being forgiven creates love. He who is forgiven much loves much. Being forgiven creates love. Love leads to true obedience. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. Forgiveness leads to love. Love leads to obedience. But all of that, all of that is done through faith. All of that is done through faith. Because it has to do with invisible things, future things, and it, all of that has to do with trusting in Christ and looking to Christ. So in other words, we trust in Christ to receive forgiveness. That's faith. But then we walk in love as we walk by faith. The only thing that matters is faith expressed in love. 
And we obey God as we walk by faith. We do not move on to a mindset of works once we're saved. Faith is how we're saved. Faith is how we serve. Faith is how we are sanctified. And faith is how we persevere to the end. So forgiveness leads to love. Love leads to obedience. All of that should be taken under faith. Quickly here, and we do have about four minutes, so I'll throw it to you for final comments and questions on just three components of faith. Uh, faith is not just believing things. Faith has, traditionally, this is how it's said, three components, knowledge, assent, and trust. So knowledge is truth. Right? You can't believe in something that you don't know. Right? I, if I'm in a burning building, I'm not going to have trust in a fireman to catch me if there's not one there or if I don't see him. I have to see him. I have to know that he's there, and then I will jump out. You can't believe in a God you don't know. You can't believe in a gospel that you don't know. There's an aspect of knowledge in faith. There's an aspect of assent. That just means agreement or even approval that you agree. Say, yes, God, this is true. I was wrong. This is true. You are right. And then there's an aspect of trust, knowledge, assent, and trust, personal trust. So just agreeing, just knowing gospel facts and agreeing that they're true is not save us. We must come to a personal trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Returning from our sins, trusting in Christ, falling down before him, empty-handed, surrendering. That is faith, knowledge, assent, and trust. Just knowing things, just agreeing that things are true is not salvation. We must come into a relationship with Jesus, and we do that by by faith. We do that by faith. Any final words or questions? Uh, Ruth, is that you raising your hand? I saw it. It broke the plane of the shoulder. So you're on the hook. Just kidding. Anyone? Reminds me very much of 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12, where the prophets who were led by the Holy Spirit to write about the Savior was doing it for our sakes. Yeah, that's a great call. Say that verse again in 1 Peter. What was it? 1, verses 10 through um, 12. Yeah, that's a great call. And I'm going to read it. 1 Peter 1. 10 concerning this salvation the prophets prophesied about the grace that was to be yours and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the spirit of christ was in in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of christ and the subsequent glories yep that's great great call great verse one of my favorite verses of first peter one and it was always about the redeemer what's the bible about the redeemer Of course, you could answer that many ways, Jesus. But people believe different things about Jesus, and the name Jesus doesn't show up in the Bible until the New Testament. So, but uh, it was always about him. All right, I'll pray for us. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word to us. Thank you for the faith that you've given us. I pray that you would strengthen our faith, help us to endure, help us to obey, help us to never take our eyes off of Christ, help us to never... Take our eyes off that hope that you promised us in him. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen.